Cecil Curry, you are a reserve army officer and a professor of history, and uh, you have written about the uh, effects of the Vietnam War upon the U U.S. military. And you have made sociological studies, I understand, about uh, the, the men who fought that war. You've talked with lots of them. What have you learned? Well, I've talked with a great number of them. Um, I learned a number of things. I learned, for instance, that the men who fought the war at the lower ranks so seldom knew why they were there when they had differences with the orders that were sent down and even protested in many cases. No one ever cared to listen. Uh, the man in the field who was able to see battle firsthand so seldom was ever considered when he'd send a report to higher headquarters saying what we really need to be doing is this. Officer after officer tried to influence the course of the war. And I mean lieutenants, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, and a few colonels, such as David Hackworth. And the higher officers ignored what they had to say. Why did that condition exist? Was that something new in the, in the history of the military, in your opinion? Something peculiar to Vietnam? One of the peculiarities of Vietnam is that we'd fought guerrilla wars many times in the past. We should have known what we were doing when we went in, but somehow the institutional army performed a frontal lobotomy on itself. It went into Vietnam like a goose that's just waked up to a brand new day. It had to start all over from scratch, and it believed that the kind of war that it would fight best was the war it had been trained for, the war against Warsaw Pact powers in Europe. And had Russia spearheaded west through the Fulda Gap or the Hof Corridor, it would have done pretty well. But to translate those same tactics into Vietnam were futile. It kept insisting on continuing in this sort of approach. People protested. Did, uh, did this uh, mental block, this mindset, did it persist all the way during the war? Or did it uh, get a little, little better as time went on? Did the military learn? I think, if anything, it got worse as the war progressed. When the war in its early phases was being handled by Special Forces troops who went in singly and in small groups and who lived and worked with mountain yards in the hills, they were reasonably successful in conducting a counter-guerrilla warfare. Later on, as the regular army went in in strength, the old ideas of fighting set-piece battles uh, finding your enemy, fixing him, and finishing him, famous army expression there, uh, tended to take over in ways that were inimical to the progress of the war. Did this uh, lack of communication, lack of appreciation to which you refer, did that frustrate the GI? Did it frustrate the, the junior officer? Did he carry that back with him? Does that in part you think contribute to the state of mind of the Vietnam veteran today? I don't honestly know how to answer your question in a very direct way. Let me only say this, that it so frustrated hundreds upon hundreds of junior officers who had initially planned on making the military their career, that once they'd performed their obligated service, they simply resigned their commissions. They would not participate further. We lost a great amount of potential because of the frustration of these people in fighting this war and in the, the kinds of tactics that they were asked to fight it with. Let me put that question a different way. Uh, you've talked with, as you say, many, many men who were in the war. Is there a psychological damage that's uh, pretty general among all of them? I think the psychological damage touches only some of them for reasons that, that may be very peculiar to each individual. Where the word, as in any conflict, a great number of individual wars going on there, and each person saw the face of battle with his own eyes. And the kinds of frustrations, uh, the disturbances, the dichotomies that individuals face, they brought back with them. For some of those, it's so disturbing that they even today can't get rid of it. For others, they managed to meld their combat experiences, or at least their experiences in Vietnam, into the whole of the fabric of their personalities more successfully. And thus, they've relatively been able to put the war behind them. Now, this question is not addressed to Professor Curry. This is to the Reserve Army officer that I'm speaking right now. Do you think the military has learned a lesson now, after Vietnam? Do you think in the General Staff College they, 
they are still thinking in terms of Warsaw Pact nations, or are they teaching a little of that kind of technique and strategy and the kind that they failed at in uh, Vietnam? That's a very good question, and I'm glad you asked that. The Army learned a number of things in Vietnam. It learned, for example, and set these down in what are called operational reports lessons learned in, in their orals, and I've examined hundreds upon hundreds of these orals. They learned, for instance, that an infantryman who carries two canteens of water is going to be less likely to become thirsty than if he carried only one. They learned that mosquito netting surrounding the sleeping quarters of an individual prohibits entry of insects. They learned that radio batteries tend to disintegrate in damp weather. My God, Moses knew these things when he led the children of Israel through the wilderness thousands of years ago. Did they learn from Vietnam? Those are the addressed lessons that they learned from their actual participation in combat. One acquaintance of mine said that he went through the infantry school at Fort Benning in 1973, just after we'd withdrawn our troops. He said that an instructor at the infantry school said to the men at the infantry school, now that we've put Vietnam behind us, that was 1973. The Army War College was specifically happy to truncate its teaching of counter-guerrilla warfare and pacification measures. When I went through the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth in 1975, out of 526 contact hours, some 60 of them were devoted to all phases of guerrilla warfare, and only a very few of those 60 had anything to do with Vietnam, despite the fact that on the faculty at that point was one of the most knowledgeable individuals the Army had in Vietnam. He was an infantry lieutenant colonel named Jean Sauvaggio. He spoke Vietnamese like a native. He'd married a Vietnamese woman. He had worn black pajamas in Vietnam, in, uh, walking and, and traveling throughout the countryside. He spoke French also, and so many of the Vietnamese thought he was a Frenchman, you see, not an American soldier. They opened up to him. He knew Vietnam. At one point or other, he briefed MACV many times on the kinds of mistakes he saw our troops making, and this man was a faculty member at the Command and General Staff College, one of the most important military schools. He was never asked, indeed the administration did not mandate that he ever talk to the student body about Vietnam. When he talked about Vietnam, he was forced to do it after hours, on the weekends or in the evenings, only to those of us who were interested sufficiently to go listen to him. He was extra, but not necessary. He was nice, and that was the Army view. Well, because this, uh, this failure went on for so long, do you feel the fact that it, the failure to learn by the military, the fact that it was not reported continuously in great detail by the American press, was a failure on the part of the press? I'm thinking of the various tangents that were reported in, in that war. What's your, what's your feeling? It was probably our best reported war in terms of total footage of film, total number of words that came out in column inches and newspapers and magazines. In that sense, it was very well reported. But reporters tend to face deadlines, really savage ones, with editors shrieking and crying at them for copy and the photos. And very often, it's easy to accept the opinion of a public affairs officer, what used to be called a public information officer, a spokesman of the military, as, as to what we just did. Here it is, boys. Here's it all typed out for you on a piece of paper that we've duplicated for you. You can all have it. Are there any questions? Uh, reporters often accepted that sort of thing, and those that listened to the troops and reported it in the papers were very few in number. I think w it might have made a real difference had more of that been done. In your uh, conversations with the, the uh, soldiers and the officers from that war in Vietnam, did, uh, did you ever ask them if they knew what the objective was, or had anyone ever pointed out to them what the objective was? Had they ever asked their superiors what the objective in Vietnam was? There were so many objectives in Vietnam. And the one, of course, that the grunt, the snuffy, the, the average GI knew, of course, was to finish out his 365 days. For the junior officers, pretty much the same thing. Uh, their objective beyond that was to find Charlie and dispose of him 
uh, the hierarchy of the military, of course, had uh, so many objectives. Uh, someone at one point has calculated that during the course of the war we had probably 12 or 15 different national and military objectives which we were trying to carry out, which, start with, which started with shoring up the French Empire and ended up with uh, peace with honor. Do you have a kind of a final verdict or summation on what the military did or did not learn? We tried to make Vietnam a high technology war against people with almost no technology and ended up teaching them a great deal of technology. When the Air Force first began operating in Vietnam, there were no defenses against it. At the end of the war, Vietnam had a very sophisticated surface-to-air missile system costing the Air Force a great number of airplanes and crews. If there's a lesson to be learned, perhaps, it may well be that high-tech wars aren't always most appropriate. We here talk today about uh, $256 billion for a uh, military budget for more high-tech weapons, uh, Abrams tanks, MX missiles, on and on and on. When many of our soldiers are on food stamps, when the best weapon that this nation ever has had or probably ever will have is a well-armed, well-trained, confident infantryman, it's a shame when he's on food stamps. It's a shame when we can't keep him in the service.